are you? Good, good. How are you? <laughs> hey, Anton. Good to see you. Good to see you, dude. How are you? <laughs> where where uh, are you right now? Um, in beautiful Austin, Texas. Uh, oh near, yeah, I miss Austin so much. But with the pandemic, I got stuck here. So, Making but you guys effort. are you guys are not in lockdown, right? That's a good. Uh, you know, they've closed some of the bars and things like that, but mostly normal life is, has resumed, you know, they've got the masks and the social distancing. It feels pretty safe. Um, with the vaccine rolling out, hopefully, you know, things will start to stabilize the next few months. So. Well, well, that's great. So, uh, I'll just do a little bit of introduction. Anton, um, he's the first person that actually invited me into blockchain and cryptocurrency. And he offered me a kind of like an advisory role for my first crypto project. And now we're doing kind of like a podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, so I am so happy to have you as the first speaker because you are amazing. And um, you are one of the early adopters in the field. And obviously you have worked through a lot of projects. Um, uh, I mean, you're you're gonna do a little bit of intro about yourself. That would be great to see what are you working on right now. But uh, but welcome and thank you again for your time. Thanks, Suzanne. It's uh, great to be here. Happy to do a quick intro uh, for anybody that doesn't know me. I'm David Johnston. Uh, most me, most people know me as the decentralized applications guy. So I <laughs> wrote the white white paper on DApps back in 2013 and uh, sort of advocated that we could take this Bitcoin model and apply it to other things that could be open source and blockchain based and peer to peer and have a token that, you know, sort of incentivizes behavior. And so people really sort of took that model and ran with it. So it's, it's been exciting to see Ethereum and all the other projects that have adopted that approach. And uh, so I've mostly got to um, be an investor, uh, sort of the first angel group at Angels back in 2013 to invest in the different protocols. And then from there, uh, started a VC and eventually a family office, uh, Yeoman's Capital. So we invest purely in blockchain and open source projects uh, since 2012. And uh, yeah, I sit on a few boards of Polymath and the Silicon Valley Blockchain Society and a lot of great projects out there. But it's just really been an amazing eight years to see this technology come from such a small nascent community to the global force that it is today. So happy to be here and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, so why did you get into cryptocurrency and when was that? Like back in 2008? Um, well, my first exposure to virtual currency uh, was pretty early on. Uh, if you guys remember Second Life, uh, there was the Linden dollar. So that mm -hmm. was the first time I was exposed to virtual currency. And I ended up starting an investment firm inside of uh, Second Life just to invest in digital real estate and stuff like that. And sort of an amazing education on what people can do when they don't have geographical borders or, you know, sort of uh, all the friction that's in the traditional system. And so um, that was my first exposure. And then uh, a friend mentioned Bitcoin to me in 2012 mm -hmm. and uh, said, David, did you hear Bitcoin hit uh, $10? And I said, what's Bitcoin? <laughs> when he finished explaining it, uh, I was like, wait, there's a, a non-governmental currency that will never be inflated by politicians is in controlled by math. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to be, uh, I'd like to really get involved in that and change over all my pieces of green paper and into Bitcoin. <laughs> so it, yeah, as you can tell, I'm a free market economics nerd from F.A. Hayek and Mises in the background. So, you know, I was, I was prepped and ready to, to make the transition. So. Well, that's great. What do you think of the uh, the current uh, situation with the COVID? I think the only thing that is actually happening in um, in economy in terms of financial market, um, the only thing that is going up is the uh, COVID infection rates and the Bitcoin market cap. <laughs> that would be, um, I think, the 2020 recap. But what do you think of um, the cryptocurrency, especially 2020 and the COVID? Well, it's been an amazing transformation. You know, I mean, certainly COVID has been very difficult for, for a lot of people, but in the technology sense, it sort of pushed us forward, um, say five years along mm -hmm. adoption curves. Like everybody went remote, everybody went digital, everybody right. was working from home, everybody was learning from home, right? right. Yeah. Uh, you can probably hear my kids in the background. <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, 
it's been a different world, but it's probably a, accelerated a lot of that adoption of cryptocurrency. All of a sudden people say, oh, I can't go to the bank. Right. I, the ATMs are empty. Like, uh, you know, all of a sudden digital is really compelling. And, and so I think uh, the, the timing, you know, in 2020 has been sort of also increased by the, the, all the printing that the governments have done, right? The right. response has been, okay, well, tax revenues are down you know, turn the crank on the printing press and let's make more dollars. Um, I think it's like 20 or 30% of all dollars that exist have been printed in the last, you know, four or five months, right? So it's, it's been this incredible inflationary event, right? And people get that, like they see prices going up, it's having a real effect on them. And so, you know, people are looking for something that doesn't get inflated, right? And so they're more open than ever. Uh, right. to crypto. It was cool to see that Coinbase uh, yesterday filed their S1 to go public. And mm -hmm. so, you know, that's, that's really um, a big milestone, you know, a big crypto company going public. And, you know, I remember meeting Fred and, and Brian and Olaf uh, back in 2013 at the San Jose Bitcoin conference. And they had a little booth and they had just raised their, their first money from Union Square and, you know, come a long way, you know, as a, as a community and as an industry. So, yeah, it sort of feels like we're at this tipping point. That's, that's great. So for the uh, listeners that are new to the concept of cryptocurrency and what you actually mentioned in terms of how COVID has associated or contributed uh, mm -hmm. for, the, uh, for the curve to actually exponentially perhaps go up, how um, how is uh, how do you explain that? For example, now the, the market is gonna uh, work better. People are gonna mm -hmm. adopt more to cryptocurrency versus U.S. dollar, uh, although uh, U.S. dollar is still the base fiat and everything is you know like being exchanged on the fiat basis and so on. Well, you know, I mean, I think people prefer honest money over time, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, dollars and the legacy financial system had a, a big network effect, mm -hmm. um, but they also have a lot of friction. You know, when I tried to send a, a wire uh, a few months ago, uh, it took four attempts and four days and cost me, I think it was $8,000 in fees. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I had to, you know, I, at first I tried to do it online and it was above their maximum. And then the second time I tried, the, the system was down for maintenance. <laughs> so the third time I went in person and the manager wasn't there at the, 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 you know, the bank to sign the thing. And the fourth time it finally went through, but they charged me for all these currency conversions and, and other things. And so there's a lot of friction uh, still left. And I'm, I'm lucky you right. know, uh, to be in the, in the first world where I have access to all exactly. these financial tools. You know, I can't imagine, you know, the challenges that somebody in Latin America or Africa or Southeast Asia faces. They don't even have access to those tools, right? And so it's, it's been, you know, I think globally refreshing for people that they can put their value in a system and they can just move it. They can send it, they can invest it, they can spend it. You know, I think Purse is a good example of that, Purse.io lets you buy things by putting it on your Amazon wish list and paying cryptocurrency for it. And people in the developing world that earn Amazon credits, you know, let's say for working on uh, the Mechanical Turk project or Amazon Turk project, they can use those to, to effectively get cryptocurrency for their credits. And the person that wants to buy the thing gets their, their, their order, right? So everybody wins. And so these bridges of sort of uh, continue to get built and open up more mm. and more. And so that's where we're getting to, you know, at first it was very tough to use cryptocurrency. You had to, you know, basically be a developer and run the open source. And now the wallets are so beautiful and intuitive and you press a button. And my, my three-year-old has a, has a, you know, a crypto wallet and she loves the sound when the <laughs> money hits the account and, you know, it was, it was funny, uh, grandma was trying to pay her for, for doing some chores. She offered her fiat and she's like, grandma, that's nice, but, but I prefer Bitcoin cash. <laughs> I, I believe I met her. I believe I met her in, uh, in Bahamas. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. She's, she's got a personality. Yeah, yeah so those, uh, those kids are gonna be the future uh, amazing leaders. Uh, yeah. Anton, do you have any comments? Yes, I can just, it's sure. So David, you can imagine 
how difficult to use uh, money and cross-border transfers if you are in Myanmar. Uh, if you remember, if you know, maybe it's a small country, 50 or 60 million people uh, mm -hmm. close to Thailand, India, mm -hmm. uh, China. Uh, and this country used to be under the military regime uh, 50 years. And uh, America banned all cross-border transfer uh, because America controls SWIFTs and whole country used to supply by cash. So they put cash in the trucks and the trucks cross the border with Thailand. So, uh, so in case you do business in, in case you have a company in uh, Myanmar and you are just an entrepreneur uh, who do, you know, who bring to country Coca-Cola. Uh, you also use uh, this Hundi or called also Hawala, uh, just this cash uh, uh, transferring in the trucks. And even now, if you want, if you come to banks, uh, sanction actually lifted it just a few years ago, but in case you're coming now to the bank, it's so difficult to send money across border. And uh, all entrepreneurs and uh, a lot of American or just like you and me, like uh, European people uh, doing business there, it's uh, so struggling for them to supply money to the country or out of the country. So, and it's just one of the example. So you're really lucky you live in the United States, but United States is just three or 4% out of all world population. You're the richest, but, and the most advanced people, but even the you are advanced people uh, should wait four days in a bank, right? Two, four, four attempts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, that's a, that's a really good point. I remember we met with you in 2017 and uh, I saw your project and think, wow, wow, this guy, he's really cool. And I know you invented this uh, word, the app, and even it uh, was even 2013, uh, there is no any Ethereum at that time, right? Ethereum maybe just on the paper, right? Just in a year. Yeah, yeah, the Ethereum, uh, they made it public in January of 14 when uh, Vitalik spoke at the Miami Bitcoin conference for the first time publicly about Ethereum, but it's sort of been floating around in the mm -hmm. ether. Vitalik and Charles and a lot of the early guys were all in a Skype group chatting about how to build, you know, scripts and programming on blockchains, right? Because uh, the background of that is so I got into Bitcoin in 2012. Uh, I became an angel investor. I launched the Bit Angels with Michael Turpin and Sam Yilmaz and you know uh, Roger and Vinny and all these early investors. Right, we were investing in 2013 into Bitcoin startups. And uh, J.R. Willett in Seattle came along and proposed Mastercoin. Right, let's put assets on the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, the Bitcoin developers were not a fan of this project um, because they just wanted to keep it purely Bitcoin transactions and not mix in these other assets. But we said, hey, you know, I'm pretty sure it's a decentralized distributed project and we can build anything we want. So <laughs> we went ahead and did it. And, uh, you know, I, I wrote the informational report and helped JR f uh, create the foundation. And um, that's actually where Tether came from, right? So Tether USD uh, by Craig Sellers and, and the team there, you know, they built initially on top of Mastercoin protocol, which was eventually rebranded the Omni protocol. And the first billion dollars or so was all done on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, but, what, but what Vitalik saw is that there wasn't enough functionality in the Bitcoin blockchain for him to build. What he really wanted to build was programmable, unstoppable, immutable applications, right? And Sharp, sort of trying to shoehorn that into into the you know very limited uh, capabilities of Bitcoin wasn't wasn't going to work right and so he decided to create his own protocol. He had been making proposals and writing papers about it of doing scripting first on Mastercoin and then realizing he needed his own blockchain. And I think that was a good way to go. Right, he ended up with the Ethereum virtual machine and a lot more uh, capacity, and it lets you move the community into a new area where, okay, everybody that wants to do that now has a place to execute on that vision. Right? I, remember, I remember the audience in Miami when Vitalik gave the first speech, literally everyone left the room as they followed Vitalik out the door when he finished his speech, right? I've you know, seen four or 500 people, like all these engineers 
sort of empty the room. It was like watching the network effect of everybody <laughs> interested in that subject, you know, literally walking away from Bitcoin and going to going to Ethereum, right? And that sort of planted that early seed of, of their community. So, you know, it's it's been amazing to see it uh, develop. But yeah, there's a lot of those early stories and how everything came about. It's amazing to see the guy who invested in Bitcoin startups back 2012. Wow. I could not uh, imagine what was going on in 2012. <laughs> I came only in the end of 2015 and I thought it was quite uh, early and I still thought, well, Bitcoin is a very, very, very super geek product, but 12, okay. <laughs> well, that's, that's funny. I had the opposite reaction when I got it in 2012. I thought I was so late. Why, why, would, why did I hear about this in 2009? What was I doing? <laughs> I didn't hear about this right away, right? And I only heard about it through a, through a friend in 2012. And so, you know, Bitcoin was already $10. You know, I'd missed the penny Bitcoin or the $1 Bitcoin. <laughs> so I was converting my cash as fast as I could because it wasn't very easy back then. You know, you had Mt. Gox, you had BitInstant. There were very few ways and you could only do like $500 a day. And you had to go to a MoneyGram place, you know, at Walmart and pick up a red phone and, you know, give them a code and send money to Japan. You know, it was very, very, uh, very difficult. You know, when Coinbase came out, that was the wonderful thing, right? Then you could connect a bank account. Then you could easily convert your cash into, into crypto. And that really sort of opened everything up, especially as Mt. Gox had their problems and, you know, collapsed. It was Coinbase and the other players that picked up the slack. Right. And that was actually healthy for the community because we moved from one single exchange where 80% of the traders were. And every time they had a problem, the whole ecosystem had a problem. Now there's an exchange hack people hardly notice because it's all the exchanges are so decentralized now. There's so many options for people. Um, it's a lot healthier than, than it used to be. So, so yours, uh, honestly, I tell people in, uh, in, in 20, uh, 2020, they're still early. Mm. It's still early in this process. Less than a trillion dollars of global wealth is on a blockchain. And we know that all the wealth in the future will be on blockchains. Who's not going to be using transparent, immutable, better databases and record keeping system? No one, right? Even the central banks, even the big banks, they've all come over that hump and said, yeah, 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 we're going to do a, a digital currency something. We're, we're working on it, right? So we know that we're going to get to hundreds of trillions of dollars of the global economy and that we're under one right now. That's still far, how far we have left to go. This is going to be another 10 years of work to transfer all the world's assets in real estate, in securities, in currencies, in commodities, all of those need to be transferred over to blockchains in one form or another. It won't all be on Ethereum. It won't all be on Bitcoin, but there's going to be a lot of different protocols to do that work because that's a lot of work. And so everybody's rolling up their sleeves. They're still early. It's still very early. Well, it's so interesting. also my question. So <laughs> what's your device? We have a lot of like participants who watch this podcast. And of course, everybody wants to know should they buy now 22k for Bitcoin for just one Bitcoin? Should they wait when it will be like when it will be back to 15? Or it never will be will, will be back to 15. And uh, it's a big question for people, guys. That's the big question, right? Um, you can't know the future. And so the tactic that most uh, sophisticated investors use is called dollar cost averaging. If you want to build a position in something, buy a small part of it every day for a month, for three months, for six months, and you're not gonna catch the top and you're not gonna catch the bottom, but you'll average in at a fairly good price, right? And that's sort of the best that you can do. Nobody has any secret solution to the future. Right? We, we all don't know the future. And so the best you can do is try to, to average in over time. Um, the other thing, it depends on your risk profile, right? If you're very conservative, you know, things like Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, Cardano, Polkadot, there's a few sort of blue chip things that are very well established. They have a lot of community. They have a lot of money. 
right? And they're sort of the blue chip, you know, if you think about that stock analogy, like the top project, they're, you know, probably all going to do well as long as they continue to get users and grow over time. Doesn't tell you exactly what the return is, but your core question should be a fundamental one. Will more people be using blockchain in the future? If the answer is yes, investing in blockchain now is, is probably going to do well. And don't try to time it. Don't try to day trade it. You know, that's a whole hundred hour a week profession to like try to track every moment and, and sell at the high and buy at the low. Buy in as a value investor. Buy in somebody that says in five years, in 10 years, if this is the future, don't try to catch all the ups and downs. That's that's impossible. This is really wise uh, advice because uh, dollars, dollar average, averaging, dollar averaging. So I think I think it's the best strategy. Best. Strategy. Yeah, dollar cost averaging is is a well proven way in, in investment theory to to really sort of uh, get into a position. Um, and again, you, people try to look at like the all time high, but trades at that for an hour right no nobody catches the top right and most people don't catch the bottom right so the best thing to do is, is try to average your wealth and think about it from your portfolio if you have a hundred percent dollars now should you be holding 10 percent bitcoin and 10 percent ethereum and maybe some of the other blue chip things um and i would leave i would leave the smaller projects to if you want to spend the extra time to learn about sort of the upcoming technologies, the things that are below a billion dollars, below a hundred million dollars, those are experiments, right? They're early stage risky investments, right? Or, or risky projects, which is good because you can get way more upside, but you have to spend more time to find out which will do well and which maybe won't work out and the experiment doesn't work. You know, What we know about the blue chips and what is sort of nice about the top projects is they're well proven, but they probably have less upside, right? Because they're already worth tens of billions of dollars. And so the nice thing about blockchain is it gives people that option, right? For the people that want to work hard and do the research and, and find out for themselves, they can they can take those risks. And that's nice because, at least in the United States, the stock market has become very tame, very risk averse. Nobody does a public offering anymore unless they're worth billions and billions of dollars, right? You've seen Instagram and, you know, all these things that are coming out. Coinbase will come out, you know, at billions of dollars, right, already. Um, and so the people that made the big money were the venture capitalists. It was the early investors that invested when it was $10 million or $20 million valuation, right? And so the regulators in the U.S. have managed to re reduce the beta, reduce the risk, but they've also reduced the reward, right? Before it used to be different. Microsoft did their IPO. I think their initial market cap was 200 million. Fairly small by, by recent standards, right? And so most people had an opportunity to get the public stock and participate in, oh, now it's worth 10 billion and 20 billion. Most people could benefit from that. But because companies have been doing their IPO because of the cost and the regulation later and later, they've missed out on that opportunity. And this is very personal to me because I was not a rich investor. I don't come from a rich family. I'm, you know, middle class guy that didn't have any money growing up, right? But as an entrepreneur, I could work hard, I could take risk, and I could get into something like Bitcoin or Ethereum, where I didn't have to be a venture capitalist to see my value increase, right? And so that's that's really amazing. Is this this industry is opening that opportunity to people like me that wouldn't have got access. You know, you couldn't have invested in Google, you know, before the IPO, you know, unless you were in Sand Hill, in California, and a VC, you had no access, but everybody's had access to Bitcoin. Everybody's had access to Ethereum since the early days. That's what's magical about this. This is why people are so passionate is because they have a chance. They can take that risk and there's appetite for that. So it's an amazing time to, to see that change. It's That's a great possible. point that you mentioned, because it's very inclusive. And at the same time, mm -hmm. you mentioned something that um, the people that did not believe in Bitcoin were actually missed out. And the people that there were like two groups of people against each other. 
uh, the middle class or the lower class and then versus the big rich or the VCs. So then they didn't believe that. And those people, you know, and they're clashing, yeah. either they're clashing right now or either the probably the VCs are joining, you know, kind of yeah. like uh, very quietly um, as we see <laughs> that how many, you know, entries have been in the Bitcoin um, in industry, uh, I mean, and the uh, investment side. So you actually raise a great point inclusive yeah now that that's the funny thing about crypto as you point out it's been the opposite of what typically happens right exactly. it's big pension funds and hedge funds and very sophisticated investors who get first access to like new products or new securities or new investments and then it kind of trickles down and by the time there's an ipo you know the average guy can can get access right but with bitcoin none of the economists like it Right. Oh, terrible, terrible a bubble, a scam, you know, and and so the institutions all held back, right? And it was the hobbyists, it was the the nerds and the you know the the you know free market economy people and and sort of all these small groups, these retail people who led the way with Bitcoin when it was 2012, 2015, 2017, long before you know any custodian was approved by the government in 2019 or 2020, like we're finally getting there, but those guys are getting in last, which is really interesting. You know, I think it was uh, Tushar Jain from Multicoin Capital who said that this is a generational wealth transfer from mm -hmm. conservative boomers to tech savvy millennials, right? And that's really interesting, right? Because a lot of the other stock market has been the other way around, right? It's the, it's the boomers that have the access or got in early, you know, decades ago. And the millennials haven't had that opportunity except for in crypto and blockchain. I hope it would uh, actually happen the same for um, Coinbase IPO, mm. which I doubt because of the primary market and the secondary market. Is that right? Well, but it's, it's already happened, right? Already Unless happened. you were an angel investor or VC, you didn't get into shares of Coinbase. Uh, Did since you get 2013. it? No, no, I, because, no. because no, I, I didn't have a VC in 2013. I, I mean, I built one in 2014, 2015 later on, um, but I didn't have that access, but mm. that's okay. Bitcoin has actually outperformed, I believe what I would have earned in Coinbase mm. and it was open to me, right? right? And so that value appreciation has already happened. You know, I don't know the exact valuation that Union Square Ventures paid for the first $5 million investment in Coinbase in March of 2013, but it was probably 10 million, 20 million, $30 million, something like that. And so, you know, it's gone from there to, I don't know what's going to come out at 5 billion, 10 billion, 15 billion. I, I don't know what the, the listing price will be. We'll see what the market takes it from there. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's amazing sort of that, that reverse, right? If you have a company structure, it's going to be the wealthy that can participate. I mean, the laws are written that way. In the United States, to invest, usually people will only accept accredited investors. And the definition of accredited in the US has nothing to do with your training or your education or your experience. It's how much money do you have? Do you have a million dollars? Do you have $2 million? You know, and they equate money with intelligence, which is a bit insulting because there's a lot of smart people that aren't rich right? And they can't access those VC and other investments. But crypto, there's no accreditation. Bitcoin protocol doesn't know people exist, right? It just continues to fairly operate and treat everybody equally. If you have a valid address, if you have a valid transaction, it broadcasts it, it gets confirmed by the network. So that's, I think, where we want to go is instead of starting companies to start public blockchains where everybody can participate on an even basis, right? Because the company, it doesn't matter how wonderful Brian Armstrong is. And I, every interactive uh, interaction I've had with Brian says he is a great human being and he's honest and he does what he says and, he, and everything has been good, but he's in a system with a company where he's forced to do certain things. He can only take those accredited investors. He has to do the listing in this way. He has to follow these regulations. Right. And he can be the best person in the world, but he still has to follow that system. 
So if you opt out of that system into something new with public blockchains, then you have a different set of mm -hmm. possibilities. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Also, I wanted to ask you about Factum and when you actually started the project, uh, what were you thinking and what does it do and what is the shape of the company right now? Sure. Well, a couple of things. So people give me more credit than I'm due. It's one of these examples. The genius that invented uh, Factum was Paul Snell. Mm -hmm. He came up with the technology. He came up with the approach. Hey, let's put data on blockchains, right? We can do more than coins. We can, we can put data on here. And that was, I think we had the first conversation about Factum in, in January of 2014, actually at the Miami Bitcoin conference. Well, it was probably the same day or the day after Vitalik announced Ethereum, right? And uh, he had this vision and knew how to build these big distributed systems. And so, you know, I was just an early investor, you know, and said, I want to support this. I want to donate, you know, to the open source. Um, and so Paul built a team in Austin and they created this whole protocol. The other misconception is that it's a company. Factum is an open public protocol. Mm -hmm. And it went from one server to eight servers to now dozens of servers run all over the world by different groups. Anybody can get elected as an authority node and help run the Factum network. So as of, it took from 2015 to 2018 to fully decentralize it. But at this point, it's fully decentralized. The foundation that originally helped uh, write the open source met all its milestones, delivered the code and dissolved project was done, right? And the for-profit went on to get contracts from Department of Energy, Department of Homeland Security, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to do all these things on blockchain. But that for-profit, I mean, they, they are part of the network, but they're not in any way controlling it, right? It's become an open source uh, thing. And there are billions of dollars of transactions now on synthetic networks like uh, Pegnet that are using Factum uh, for a tenth of a penny to do blockchain transactions. And the way Factum works just to back up for everybody is it anchors into Bitcoin and Ethereum. So every 10 minutes, it takes all the information and puts it into a little transaction via Merkle root and publishes that data from Factum into a Bitcoin transaction, into an Ethereum transaction. So what Factum did is sort of pioneered this idea of a second layer. Right, long before the Lightning Network was live, long before most of these other approaches, we said, we need a second layer. We can't shove everything into Bitcoin and Ethereum directly. Even Ethereum can't, can't handle all that data, right? We have to put it on a second layer. Factum can be that second layer. So Paul did a great job of, of pioneering that technology and he's continuing to sort of think through and build how do you scale uh, this technology? So I like that things and you know, Factum is one of the 20 projects in my portfolio, but I love when an entrepreneur or a technologist invents something new, right? There's a lot of people that sort of make a small change, and then there's a few people that make big changes, you know, like a Vitalik was, we need programming on blockchain. Paul said, we need data on blockchains, right? We need uh, Craig, you know, and the team at Tether, you know, we need assets on the blockchain. Let's, let's put on dollars and gold and all these other things, right? And so that's what I try to look out for. It's like, who's making the next big step that will build the infrastructure? Um, and then I would just say, most of my work has been at that, that lower level. I like to say, I, I don't know which application will be most popular, but I'm pretty sure I know which platforms they'll all run on. And from an investor perspective, that's like investing on the casino. Mm -hmm. I don't know which player is going to win. I just know the house always wins right? <laughs> the casino gets, gets most of the money. So I want to invest in, in, in the house, in the platform, uh, rather than applications itself. And so I, I try to keep inside of my, my area of knowledge in the platforms. Yes, much more. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what are your picks for like coming years? What do you think, uh, who's uh, invented something cool? And uh, so I know now it's a big hype of DeFi, of DeFi, of money Lego, uh, building technologies combining this uh, Lego, and uh, like why earn finance, uh, Uniswap, Compound, Avia. So, yeah. what are your picks? What, what, what yeah. do you think? You just said the four, right? <laughs> Those are the big groups. 
uh, doing a lot of stuff on DeFi. If you look back at my interviews in, in 2019, I was saying 2020 would be the year of DeFi. Like I could see the growth rate and I knew as soon as it crossed a billion, you know, people would start paying attention and really start to take off. So we've certainly seen that this year. I think we've crossed 14, 15 billion dollars in, in DeFi. And the reason is, is because we're rebuilding finance. You know, my, my bank account, maybe I get 1% to half a percent. Nobody gives me five, six, seven percent like they used to. You used to be able to get back when banks made loans, right? Before they just printed money, they made loans and businesses paid them back and you could get some of that, that value. And so in addition, I'm holding my value in, in Ethereum and Bitcoin anyway, or, or stable coins. Why don't I get a return while I hold those, those values anyway? Right, get a return on my Bitcoin or my Ethereum is very attractive. So I think for the next year, those type of uses, use cases are gonna continue to be the big story. Is DeFi maturing, right? We saw a big hype and then some of that died down, but the big projects, the good projects, they're still growing, right? Compound is doing well, uh, you know, Ava is doing well, uh, you know, Uniswap released their token and they took off, right? So. You know, you mentioned uh, Yearn Finance with YFI is, is building all over the place, right? So there's lots of growing pains, but the fundamentals are continuing to grow and nothing's changed on the other side. There's no bank offering me a good interest rate. So they're gonna keep taking money from the legacy financial system and putting it into DeFi. Um, there's a one project that's particularly uh, close to my interest is, is PegNet, uh, P-E-G-N-E-T. And they're putting pegged assets, similar to synthetics, onto uh, the blockchain. So if you wanted pegged gold or pegged Bitcoin or pegged Ethereum or pegged dollars, instead of using a reserve or collateral, they use oracles. So they have miners and stakers that provide the oracles for all the pegged assets. This has been a really experimental project the last year. They've gone through a bunch of iterations. They got to their 2.0. Uh, just recently, uh, the end of this year. And it's been exciting to see because it's, it's one of those new things, right? Increasingly tether and reserves are coming under pressure from regulators that say, oh, you have to have an audit, you have to have permission, you have to have a license. And so with DAI, right, people can just provide collateral. But what's even better than collateral is oracles in my view, right? If I can trust the data, and I know that the oracles are well secured, then that's better than having collateral, which maybe the smart contract gets hacked. And it's better than having reserves, which maybe the company has a problem, right? So if you remove the risk of the smart contract, you remove the risk of the centralized company, oracles are an interesting way of doing that. And what's cool to me is, is PegNet sort of goes back to the way Bitcoin was launched. There was no pre-mine, there was no formal team. There was no, you know, uh, centralization at all. Just open source, and it was mined from the very beginning. And the only peg that exists are ones that people put value into that network, and people put, you know, mining effort into earning those peg, right? And so it's it's this idea of fair launch. I think is very important, right? You know, and I believe Ethereum was a fair launch, right? People put in capital, people put in dev work, or people mined it. As long as there's some um, way to record the value that's been contributed and people are rewarded in proportion to that value. I, I believe it's a fair launch, but there's been a, a lot of good progress on that. But I'm really passionate about PegNet. I've, I've donated to the open source and the developers and talked a lot about it because I see what's coming on the regulation side for stable coins. Maybe you guys saw the law that was proposed in the US, the Stablecoin Act. Um, maybe you saw the rules from the Financial Stability Board that came out after uh, the G20 asked them to propose the rules. So there's a lot of rules coming for how to do assets on blockchain. And I believe you have one choice, fully regulated or fully decentralized. There's not gonna be anything left in the middle. You can be BitTorrent or you can be Apple Music, but you can't be Napster. Napster days are gone, right? Which one's gonna <laughs> fully win? decentralized or fully regulated, yeah. Which one's gonna win? They'll both exist in parallel. 
just like BitTorrent continues to exist and be 20% of all the internet traffic, right? A lot of people use BitTorrent for music and videos, but people also buy a lot of music on, on iTunes, mm -hmm. right? And it boils down to different considerations, right? If you're a big company, they're gonna go fully centralized. They're gonna use USDC, they're gonna use Libra, which I guess is now Diem, as, as their regulated stablecoin, that's fine. But for the person that can't pass KYC, that doesn't have an address, maybe he lives in Nigeria, maybe he's not even allowed to mm -hmm. access Libra, his only option is gonna be the decentralized system, right? It's gonna be the PegNet, it's gonna be the Peg Dollars, PUSD, and things like that, where he can just put money in the wallet, he can use the stable coins, maybe he's using it for some DeFi contracts, he can take it back out. The nice thing I like about PegNet is there's no third parties. Mm -hmm. Because it's using oracles, you're not mixing collateral with anybody else. You're not trading with anybody else. It's all inside your wallet. And that's the ultimate of decentralization when there's nobody else involved in the process. So for people that need it, they're gonna go decentralized. And for those that have the luxury of being in the regulated world, they'll probably use something like USDC. So both, both are gonna exist in parallel going forward. Interesting. Also, um, in terms of how to keep the, uh, the digital assets, uh, uh, usually it is recommended to have a cold wallet. Is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, which one, oh, the, the wallets out there, what would you kind of like suggest in your opinion, like Tezor or Celsius or Coinbase or the variety that is out there? And in terms of safety um, and also just like the physical damages, you know, all the risks associated with mm -hmm. that. That's a good question. Um, you know, I definitely recommend uh, a cold wallet. You know, if you're going to hold the value, don't keep it on a live computer. Um, you know, it's a mistake uh, a lot of people make, unfortunately. You want to use a strong password. You know, as soon as you have money online, you really want to up your cybersecurity, right? There's basic things like you should never use your phone number for account recovery. You should never use SMS for two-factor. You know, should be using Google Authenticator or a UV key or something more, more strong like that um, because phone numbers are a central point of failure, right? Any 18 year old at a, you know, AT&T kiosk could uh, change, you know, oh, that phone number, the device was lost and now it, now it goes over here, right? And so unfortunately it's, it's forced people to take their, their security more, more seriously. But for most people, you know, I think having a wallet on their computer is better than having a wallet on an exchange. The worst thing you can do is have somebody else hold your crypto. As they say, not your keys, not your coins, right? If it's sitting on some exchange and that exchange goes away, you don't have your, your money, right? And none of the exchanges that I used in 2012 still exist. Mt. Gox is gone, BitInstant is gone, all these early players are gone. And I believe the players now are much better. They're better insured, they're better run, they're better financed, but it's the, the rule stays the same, right? Really, you want to hold your own, own keys for so many reasons in crypto. Um, and so I recommend Exodus.io, great wallet, beautiful wallet, supports most of the major coins. The Exodus team has done an amazing job of updating every few weeks uh, the wallet to include all the newest things. And it's only on your computer. It's not hosted on an exchange, but it has many of the capabilities that you would want out of an exchange. You can swap tokens. You wanna to go from Ethereum to Bitcoin or Bitcoin to whatever else. You can do that inside the wallet by sending the capital and then you get it back the next, next block. So you're not depositing your token somewhere long-term. So Exodus.io, great wallet. There's a lot of iPhone wallets. Uh, Bread, BRD is a great wallet that you have your own node actually uh, you're directly connected to the peer-to-peer -peer network on your phone. So you're not even going through an intermediary on the server. And so there's, there's so many cool options uh, for holding, but if you're storing a lot of money, you might wanna research paper wallets and take it offline entirely, right? It's just that private key at the end of the day. Um, but if you do that, what I would say is back it up, make a copy, make many copies. <laughs> More people that I know than have been hacked have just lost the password. Right, so you have to really, really store that that password. Well, just just be smart about it. But the more you read 
and sort of as you go up that learning curve, the more that you're storing, get more serious about how you store. Don't keep it all on your phone if you've got a million dollars. You know, it's think about it like your wallet. How exactly. much money would you walk around in your wallet? Hundred dollars, okay, a couple hundred dollars, not a big deal, but you wouldn't keep fifty thousand dollars in your wallet. So think about it the same way. David, I also recommend uh, for very paranoid guys mm -hmm. who really worry about the crypto to create all seed phrases by themselves. Mm -hmm. I'm usually use dice. You know, Jan Koleman, open source uh, website. So mm -hmm. I, you're like throwing dice cubes 100 times and you can generate real randomness number because probably you don't trust entropy chip in uh, this ledger, right? Who, right. Which you're creating. A random number right now that's that's a good point there's there's ways to do that entirely offline and uh, then send value into that wallet based on on the key so yeah you know I, i've been fortunate not to to lose crypto via um either forgetting passwords or or a hack you know um but i know a lot of people that that have and so the the first thing for 99 out of 100 people is just to back up that password and, and, and have a copy and never put it online, right? Never take a picture of it, never put it in digital form uh, if you can. So. Uh, what you mentioned about DeFi and actually 2020, uh, you estimated that. Um, so now with the DeFi and obviously like uh, citizens around the world are facing a lot of issues, especially even like during COVID right now. I mean, the government and all these restrictions and the shutdown. So, and now DeFi is playing a huge deal in terms of bringing that kind of like concept of, you know, bankless. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think of a bankless society where governance is decentralized? People have their own freedom of voice voting, um, not, you know, kind of like, uh, uh, to be shut down or to be a uh, quarantine, you know, what do you think of that? And would we have that kind of like future? Yeah, I think that type of future is inevitable. Um, and I actually think it'll probably be the majority of the world, right? As you said, statistically, the number of Americans, even if you include Europeans, is fairly small. Um, compared to the populations in Asia and Africa and other places around the world. So I think for, for most people, they're going to have that opportunity and freedom uh, to run their own finances. And, and really what I hope we end up with over time is a separation between money and state, right? Just the way we have a separation between church and state, right? I would be very offended in 2020 if the government tried to tell me what to believe, right, about my faith. You know, I think we should be equally offended that government tries to tell us what is money, right? Because that is a personal decision that, that people make and governments have a terrible record <laughs> of, of creating money. I mean, you look at this uh, posters behind me, I've got a hundred failed government currencies. Oh, they are failed. And, and most of those were printed in the last 30 years. Belarus has had three currencies since the fall of the wall, right? Governments, we're in a little bubble in the West that we think currencies last for a while. Most people, the currency doesn't last very long, right? And so governments have done a, on a terrible job. And so it's time to hand over the reins to something as neutral, incredibly neutral, like a protocol where the monetary system is described in code and everybody can verify it. And it doesn't change with the whims of politicians and of bankers. That's, that's an amazing revolution, right? That's an amazing change. And kind of feels like we're going back to what the gold standard was. The gold standard was in a way neutral and open and verifiable, right? And in 1971, when Nixon decided he needed more money for the Vietnam War and he was gonna break the gold peg, you know, we went off into this you know, sort of imaginary land of, oh, we can just make as much money and there are no consequences. The consequences, have been paid by everybody that's not a banker. You know, you see that, that famous chart where it shows income and productivity, right? They were very closely aligned during the gold standard. And then as soon as you break the gold pick, the productivity keeps going up. We have robots and software and we're more productive than ever, but the average person's not seeing the benefit of that. They've, they've been steady. There's been no real growth in income since the 1970s. And so that's the reason is because finance 
because it got the first access to money gets the outsized benefit. Finance industry historically was 7% of the economy. Today it's 14% of the economy and 35% of all corporate profits. The car companies don't make money from making cars, they make money from financing cars, right? It's the banks that have the biggest buildings downtown because they make all the profits off of what everybody else does. That's not the historical case. That's a weird 50 year bubble that's starting to come back to reality where everybody else would like the benefit of their hard work and of productivity increases and all these things. And so this is, this is an effort to really change that. You know, we, we don't wanna live at the whim of central bankers anymore. And so I think that's, that's something that people can agree on and most people want for themselves because most people aren't bankers. Exactly. And as you mentioned, they're not just controlling the financial industry, they're controlling basically everything. And, and obviously with donations and towards, you know, different initiatives in the society, they're, uh, you know, controlling the causes, they're controlling the hashtags in Twitter, and they're controlling everything. And they're basically, you know, impacting our lives in a really big uh, way. Yeah. And honestly, the they don't even need control. They don't even care. They benefit no matter what gets built or what gets bought or what gets done. At the end of the day, they end up with most of the profits, right? Because in an inflationary system, it's the person that has first access to the inflation that gets most of the benefit. Whoever's closest to that Fed window gets most of the benefit. And then the guy that gets that inflationary a year later He's lost, he's lost his money, right? Inflation only has to be, let's say, 5%. I'm talking about real inflation, right? Because when they talk about inflation, they talk about the CPI, consumer mm -hmm. price index, right? How much did goods go up? But that's deceptive, right? If, if goods went from a dollar to a dollar three, but productivity increased 2%, the gap isn't between one and 103, it's between 98. And 103. The real inflation, let's say, is 5%. So take that over 10 years. You put your you work hard, you put your money in a bank account, and 10 years later, half of all your value just disappeared. It just rotted away, right? And so it it warps incentives where we have to chase stock market values and chase real estate values because it's the only way to keep up with the inflation that's that's going on. And so what I think we're unleashing here is sort of a golden age of prosperity for everyone else when they can uh, finally participate in the real economy, the real you know, uh, benefit of their productivity and their work you know, will be shared over a much larger group of people. And to your point where they probably spend most of those, those donation dollars is with economists and with politicians, right? You know, this is why, you know, none of the Keynesians liked Bitcoin. It's like, oh, I'm not going to get paid from that. <laughs> and so they paid by the bankers and the governments to do studies. And so they produce pro, you know, inflationary uh, policies and studies. So, you know, it's, it's funny, these, these free market guys like Hayek and Mises were sort of in the corner with no funding, you know, left alone in the dust for 50 years. All of a sudden they're rock stars because the truth of what they said is finally being seen by everyone. I think government, they don't want to lose this monopoly. Uh, last few thousand years, I don't know what about like ancient Egypt or ancient Shumer, but last few thousand years, government governments definitely controlled this monopoly. And I think it will be quite painful for them to lose this authority well, they've, to print. They've tried to, they've tried to control the monopoly. Uh, so you look at the history of Rome, for example. They started with the uh, fully gold-based uh, currency. And over time, they're always tempted, right? So they, oh, now it's half-based on gold. Now 25% uh, based on gold, you know, 10% based on gold. And by, by the end of the Roman Empire, they're just cranking out coins and they have no real basis, right? And yeah. so every government is tempted by free money. They can't resist the temptation of the free money, right? It just happens again and again. It's like drug. It's like drug. It's, yeah. it's really like drug. It's the perfect drug for governments because when you pass taxes, people might get upset. 
they don't like the taxes. They don't want to pay more money to the government. But ah, if we just print some more money, they won't see that. It's an invisible tax, right? 5% more money, eh, they probably won't notice. Nobody can object. You know, it's, it's easy to go with inflation. It's harder to go with taxes. But, but then you get these unsustainable bubbles. You know, the U.S. government budget is now three, four trillion dollars, right? But they don't collect that much in taxes. They collect a lot less than that in taxes. And so the difference is printing money, right? It's the Federal Reserve loaning money, loaning money to the federal government to close the gap. Right. And so every year the national debt goes higher. Right now, twenty trillion dollars, whatever it's up to is north of twenty trillion dollars. And just keeps growing, right? And so it's it's unsustainable because you know, at some point the interest rate on the debt becomes larger than the entire country's GDP, <laughs> and then the game is up, right? So this never ends well. And so our goal as entrepreneurs and technologists and as a community ought to give, be to give people an option because that's the only way we solve this problem. Otherwise, the collapse, they do it again. Collapse, they do it again. Collapse, they do it again, right? The only way out is to have an alternative, right? It wasn't... The Cold War didn't end because the US invaded the Soviet Union. The Soviets just went broke. They couldn't pay their soldiers. They couldn't pay their military. Nobody wanted to be in the system and they were trying to leave, right? To the West, right? And that's what finally made the change. In the same way, it's not because there's going to be a violent revolution for, for crypto. It's just the existing system is going broke and we're giving people an option to opt into something that's much better, much faster, much more honest, right? So I think that's that's something really fun to participate in. So average mayor, it's like in a, you know in a Poland. So I, I have a Polish citizenship, and uh, in a Poland, some mayors go into their work by bicycle because they're trying to save uh, taxpayers' money. <laughs> so government will start to save money when yeah. the money start to cost for them, cost real cost. Yeah, hopefully you'll have less wars. The biggest budget item in the US is a trillion dollars a year on war. We've been at war my entire adult life. 9-11 was, I was 16 when 9-11 happened. First Afghanistan, then Iraq, and then on and on. We've literally been in this perpetual, you could not possibly support this type of policy if you didn't have free money and the money printer. It's the same reason the war on drugs in the U.S. has ended. I don't know if you guys know this history, but in 2008, the financial crisis hit, right? The government, the federal government can print the money, but the states were going bankrupt, right? California, New York, Colorado, Texas, right? Their budgets, they don't have the printing press, right? Only the federal government can use that. So they were tight on budget and they said, we're spending all this money on prisons, billions and billions of dollars. What if we got paid for cannabis work? What if people could grow it and sell it and we, we tax it? All of a sudden, Colorado is making billions of dollars from legalizing marijuana and all the other states. Why are we still paying for the prisons again? Oh, the federal government's not paying for these anymore? Okay, yeah, happy to end prohibition, you know, you know and one by one, all the states are, are going towards legalization, right? So if you wanna end a war, you have to change the financial incentives for that war. And I'm very optimistic. You know, that's something Roger Bear talks about a lot. I love that his heart is about ending violence, right? And that's what I want to do. I want to end violence. We ought to be relying on math, not on a monopoly with guns to bring about peace and prosperity in our society. It's a theory of everything, theory of everything. So yeah. all our galaxy of our Disney universe based on math actually yeah. right. it's what einstein or and many many other scientists have proved yeah absolutely and and my my joke is uh you know it's hard to point a gun at math very tough you're very tough to you know to do that math doesn't care right and and it, you can have all the tanks in the world but math doesn't care it exists on a different plane you know it is the basis and fundamental of the universe and so I think we're in this transition from violence-based societies to math-based societies, right? And this is a great thing, right? This is empowering people, right? 
you know, people are then valued based on what they do and what they produce and what they say and how they help other people, not based on if they have the gun, right? And that's how society was, right? The guy with the biggest club, the chief leader, right? The head of the state, whoever can invade the other countries has all the money and the power, right? And that's less and less true, right? Okay, great, you've got lots of guns, but that doesn't affect the economy over here, right? We have freedom in that, so it's it's exciting. Thank you, David. Thank you. It's a very. I think it's one of the best words I'm uh, like hearing so far about the math. That it's mm -hmm. really uh, on what should we build our new economy, future economy for our kids, for our new generation. Azam, your turn. Or oh, maybe should we wrap up? Yeah. So. Uh... Thank you so much, David, for, for your time and for your uh, amazing uh, discussion. We really enjoyed it. And uh, we hope that to have you again soon on another time. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. I appreciate you guys inviting me. And thanks for the flexibility on everything. Great, great discussion. Yeah, thank you. And stay safe. And a and happy new safe. year. Happy holidays. New year. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, David. It was very nice to talk with you. Me too, Anton. Take care. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye.